In this lecture, we're going to look at C++ and its implementation of object-oriented features using something called virtual function tables or vtables. C++ is a really big and interesting programming language. Since the late 90s, the language has been evolving mostly through a series of standards, starting with C98 up to currently C17. And there's all sorts of new features that have been added through this standardization process over the years. These new features include a memory model for concurrency. This is my personal area of research, not totally relevant for this class, but you can also see lambda expressions, which we've studied, R values, that's temporary values, as references, and then the ability to move those around. Um, C++ has added type inference, as in Scala. It's also added uh, tuple types, which we've seen in Scala. There are lots of great resources on C++. I've just linked a few here. These are books that are available in Safari that is for free through DePaul's library. There's also some uh, great resources available online. For example, this uh, huge fact from the ISO and um, a wiki book on programming in C++. If you're familiar with the book Effective Java by Joshua Block, you'll appreciate the book Effective Modern C++, which sort of goes through the language looking at the right way to code C++. Not everything you can possibly do, but the best thing you can do. We talked a little bit about C++ when we talked about dispatch and inheritance in object-oriented languages. And I used this example where we have an animal, a bird, and a cat class, and we have an array full of animal pointers. That array contains a bird and a cat. And what we're going to do is ask each of those animals to convert themselves to a string so we can print them out. For this program, we noticed that the output gave us animal, animal, and not bird cat. And that's because C++ does static dispatch by default. These methods are not declared to be virtual and therefore they are statically dispatched. If we do make them virtual and we use a pointer to reference the objects, then we do get dynamic dispatch in C++. So here I've just added the keyword virtual to each method. I am accessing these through a pointer variable that's a pointer to an animal. And I have an array of pointers here to get through. When we talked about call by reference parameter passing, I mentioned that C++ has reference variables and that they're related to pointers. We can look at the same example using a reference instead of a pointer. However, we run up against the limitation that C++ does not allow arrays of references. This is because references aren't really considered proper variables. They're not proper places in memory that can be assigned. They're really just aliases for things that already exist. In any case, we can repeat this example where I just directly bind the reference x to the bird that I've created and then try to put out the string associated with that bird. And you'll see that I do get the right thing here. I do get dynamic dispatch because the reference is also using a pointer or some sort of indirection. It's not a value that I have, it's a reference. So in C++, if I have a reference or a pointer and a virtual method, then I'll get dynamic dispatch. If the method is not virtual, I'll get static dispatch regardless of whether I'm using a reference or a pointer. And if I directly have an object value, not a pointer or a reference, then regardless of what the method is, I don't get dynamic dispatch. I'm going to get static dispatch. This last fact may be curious. What's going on here? I've got a bird and a cat in an array of animals. And note that here it's not a reference or a pointer. It's actually the bird and the cat. They're stored directly in this array. And what happens here when I go through that array, I create copies of those birds and cats or whatever is in the array as I go. So this is something we don't actually have an analogy to in Java. And it's interesting to sort of drill into it and see what's going on. In C++, I can find the size of any type in memory using the size of operator. 
I can also find the size of a variable and how much storage it takes. I've got three classes here, animal, bird, and cat. The animal class should take three bytes because it's got three characters. The bird should take eight bytes because it extends the animal class. So we've got the three bytes from the animal class plus five more for the bird. And similarly, we can think that a cat should have 10 bytes, so three for the animal and then seven more for the cat. And in fact, this is true. If you look at the array of animals, however, you might be surprised. What, what I've got here is not enough space for a bird or a cat. The array XS only has enough space to hold the two animals. We can't hold the fields that are specific to birds and cats because there's only three slots allocated for each animal, and those three slots are for the A array of that animal. What's going on here is that we don't have enough space in the animal array to store all of the bird and all of the cat. So what we do is we just slice away the part that is not part of an animal. So it, we're effectively losing these extra fields. So the B field for bird and the C field for cat are just tossed away. And we create a new copy that just has the three byte array from the animal class. This is called object slicing in C++, and it can cause some anomalies, but here it's not really a problem. It, it's just the fact that we don't have enough storage, and this is what we expect in C++. We're just copying part of the bird into this animal variable, not the whole thing. And this helps explain why we can't expect dynamic dispatch when we have a value corresponding to an object type because the type of the value tells exactly how much storage is allocated there. We, we, we can't possibly do anything dynamic. In order to get around this, we need to use a pointer or a reference. We can't actually take the size of a reference because it's not a real thing, but we can take a size of a pointer. And you'll see here that if you look at the size of the animal pointer, the bird pointer, the cat pointer, they're all the same size. When we look at the array, we have enough space for two of those pointers. So in this case, there's no problem with the array actually holding on to the bird and the cat pointers themselves. And therefore, there's no reason to slice the object. We, we don't slice objects when we copy the pointers around. The objects are unmolested in memory and we're just copying pointers from one place to the other. So here, I'm, I'm not actually copying the bird or the cat. We don't copy the array A here when we um, create the array XS. All we're doing is copying the pointer associated with the bird and associated with the cat into the array. It's interesting to note that methods are not stored with objects. So you can put methods in the class as much as you want, and it does not increase the size of the resulting object. This is a major goal for class-based languages. The idea here is to avoid duplication by saying that the classes will hold methods and the objects will just hold fields. But if I'm not storing the method somehow dynamically with the object, how can I possibly implement dynamic dispatch? When the answer is, of course, I can't. Here I have a non-virtual method, and so we're doing static dispatch, and so this is fine. What happens if I make the method virtual? Well, in that case, it does take some space, and you can see the size here goes up quite a lot. What's happening here is that I'm on a 64-bit machine, and therefore we have eight bytes for a pointer in this machine. And in order to store an array of three elements and also an eight-byte pointer, well, I need to have eight plus three, that's 11. But if I'm going to have an array of these things, I don't want to space them out every 11 bytes. I want to make sure they're aligned on eight byte boundaries. And so we're going to make sure that the objects are actually sized at multiples of eight. So an animal then will take 16 because that's the smallest multiple of eight that is greater than eight plus three. And that's the same thing that we get for a bird. And there we're just right at the limit because we have eight bytes for the character arrays and then eight bytes for the pointer. That's exactly 16. Um, a little bit more like we have in the cat here and that tips us over. So we need um, yet another eight bytes in order to store a cat. 
So if I add more virtual functions, do I get an even bigger object? Well, no, you don't. Here I've added a second function f to the cat class, but that hasn't affected its size. Why is this? Because we have a table of virtual functions and a pointer to that table. And therefore, if we have one virtual function, we need a pointer to the table, but the table can increase in size without actually having to have extra pointers. So if you think about it, well, we have a virtual function table or array, and that's why we call it a vtable for short. This concept of a vtable is used in one form or another by all object-oriented languages to implement dynamic dispatch. We're going to look at it in C++ compiled down to the Intel architecture. I'm choosing to look at Intel because it should be familiar from your prerequisite class. And we're looking at C++ because it's easy to generate a real concrete representation in assembly language using a compiler. So what we're going to do is look at some C++ source code, look at the output in assembly language that's generated, and try to identify the vtables and the other object structure in the assembly language. Your textbook on programming language concepts covers a lot of these ideas. You can look at chapter 7 for assembly language and the call stack, and you can see chapters 11 and 12 for some discussion of vtables. One thing to note is that Mitchell is just talking abstractly about these ideas, and so his diagrams don't exactly correspond to what you get in Intel's architecture. You don't actually need to know that much assembly language to be able to read a bit, so I'll just walk through the basics. The Intel 64-bit architecture has 64-bit addresses and 64-bit registers. The registers have names like RAX, RDX, RDI, and if you want to just look at half of a register, you change the R to an E. And this is going to look at the lower order half of that register. That's four bytes instead of eight. When you call a function, the first parameter for that function is put into the register RDI. That'll be enough for what we need to look at. In fact, Intel puts the first four or five parameters into registers. As we'll see though, when you're looking at unoptimized assembly language, it immediately writes those registers out to the stack and then uses them on the call stack. There's a few special purpose registers, including the instruction pointer, the base pointer, and the stack pointer. So the base pointer and the stack pointer are used to manage local variables, and the instruction pointer is used to tell us which line of code to execute. Assembly syntax is not particularly beautiful. We have uh, move instructions like this, which moves a quad word or eight bytes uh, from one place to another. So on the left-hand side, I'm calculating eight bytes off of the base pointer, that's RBP, and then we're gonna move that into the register uh, A. We can also move uh, oh, four bytes by using move L instead of move Q in which case the destination here is the E register instead of the R register. When we have static dispatch, it's really easy to implement in assembly language. What we're going to use is something called a direct call. A direct call is exemplified here. I have a greet function which calls directly the greet English method. So it's like the only language I know is English. So when you ask me to greet, I'm going to do it in, in English. And so here, the greet method will call the greet English method. And there's some sort of you know, calling protocol here. It's, it's not particularly important to us um, what exactly that protocol is, but we're gonna do something to get from the greet method into the greet English method. And you can see in the assembly language, it's just a direct call. Direct calls aren't enough to support Lambda abstractions. They're not enough to support dynamic dispatch. So Intel also supports the notion of a indirect call, where instead of directly calling a label in the program, I actually call using a pointer value inside of a register. Here's an example of that, where I've got um, a new language I learned. So my greet method now takes a Boolean, whether I want to use English or not. So if I use English, I'll, I'll use the English version. Otherwise, I'll take Spanish. And here I'm going to use a function pointer. So P here is a variable that is a pointer to a function that takes nothing and gives you back void. Reading C types is exciting.
But anyway, that's what that is. That's declaring P, believe it or not. And what I'm going to do is assign P here, if I use English, to be the address of the greet English function. Otherwise, I'll take the address of the greet Spanish function. And we can directly do this just using the address of operator. Then when we want to invoke a function through a pointer, we dereference the pointer and we use the function call syntax. These little parentheses are necessary just to get the thing to parse properly. But this is how we invoke the function pointed to by P. When we look at the assembly language output of this, it's going to look something like this. I've got the test for whether or not uh, I should use English. Then, uh, based on that test, I will either load the address of greet English or the address of greet Spanish into the register, in this case, RAX. Note that here this is done via indirect addressing. So I'm working off the current instruction pointer and that has calculated something for us. So there's uh, some calculation happening here relative to the instruction pointer and likewise here. But then once I've loaded RAX with the appropriate value, I can simply call it. And here I'm going to use the call indirect syntax where I use a register to indicate where the instruction pointer should jump. This really has just the effect of uh, pushing the stack pointer and then loading the contents of RAX into the instruction pointer. That's what a call queue is going to do here. So let's look at how C++ actually lays out objects and does dynamic dispatch. I'll start just looking at fields. We'll have a bird class and it has a couple of fields and then a duck class which extends the bird class and provides a few additional fields. And here in my main program, I can load up uh, the duck with its four values and then access those values uh, through a bird reference. So here, if I look at the duck as a bird, I can access its bird-like properties. And I'll actually get out what I expect here. Since I assigned the first bird field to 2948, that's what I'm getting out here when I look at it. So to understand the layout of the object, let's look at the assembly language in the C side by side. Here's my C++ code on the left, my assembly code in the middle, and some explanatory figures on the right. And what I'm showing you here is that a bird is laid out as having two fields. A duck extends that bird with two additional fields. And this is what the layout will look like eventually for a duck. We're going to have B1 at the zero offset, B2 at four bytes off. That's because integers require four bytes. Then D1, eight bytes off, and D2, 12 bytes off. You can see this in the assembly code as I assign the variables. So first I'm going to create a new duck. Um, the new duck variable is going to be stored at eight off the base pointer. That's where my local variable goes. And you can see I load that into RAX. And then I'm writing 9032 at 8 off of RAX. So what is 8 off of RAX? Well, that's the location of D1. You can see that's 8 off of the beginning of the object. And we do the same thing for writing D2. That's 12 off of RAX. When we go into B1, that is just 0 off of RAX. So we don't need the uh, addition here. And finally, B2 is 4 off of RAX. You can see in the assembly code that when I take a duck pointer and copy it into a bird pointer, all I do is just copy the pointer. There's no changing of the value. There's no slicing. Nothing weird happens. I'm just copying the pointer around. I can then use that pointer, which here you can see is 16 off the base pointer. That's going to be the local variable B. Then to access B1 through that pointer, well, I simply load the object address and then get the value at that location. If I want to get B2, then I have to offset 4 off of the original object location. So you can see here really easily how things are laid out. We have a duck. It requires 16 bytes, and that's because I've got 4 times 4 integers, each of which are 4 bytes. And that's my duck layout. This is how it all works out. Let's look at what happens with virtual methods. 
here I've added functions one and two to my bird class. I override function two in the duck class and add an additional function f3. We're going to give ourselves a duck and then we're going to call f1, f2, and f3 on it. Then we're going to take the duck pointer, store that as a bird pointer. We can call f1 and f2. Note that using a bird pointer b here, I won't be able to call f3 because f3 is actually not defined in the bird class. This does do what I expect. On line 21, we're going to get bf1 because b is an inherited method. We're going to get on line 24 df2 because that's an overridden method. On line 25, we're going to get df3, of course, because that's a new method. And then when we go to the bird reference, it's not going to do anything different than the duck because we have dynamic dispatch. So we're going to get the inherited f1 and then the overridden f2. By looking at the assembly language, we can see how C++ achieves all of this. First, if we look at the layout of the derived duck class, we'll note that we've got an additional space allocated for this v table. If we if we just have some code that initializes b1, that's the first bird field. It used to be that b1 was at zero off of the object pointer, but if you look here in the assembly code, you'll see that b1 is now eight off of the initial object location. And that shows us here, we've got this b1 field at this location. And that's because we, we've got to have space for the v table pointer, and that's eight bytes right at the beginning of the object. Note that a bird is just a prefix of a duck. So if I want a bird, I just look at the first 16 bytes of the duck, and that's a bird. The same thing happens in the v table. So if we look at the v table for a bird, it would have two slots, one for f1 and one for f2. But if we look at the v table for a duck, it's going to have three slots. And the extra slot here is for f3. So note that we have in the v table for the duck some inherited code, that's our pointer for f1, and some overridden code, that's our pointer for f2, as well as some new code, that's our pointer for f3. And you can see all of this happening in the assembly language when I call f1, f2, f3. Method calls are a little more complicated than field access, so let's walk through this one piece at a time. First, I'm going to grab the local variable holding the object reference. Note that in this particular compilation, it, it put it at a different place. Uh, before it was, uh, I think, 8 off of the base pointer, now it's at 24. So in this particular time that I ran the compiler, the pointer to D is 24 off the base pointer. So initially we're loading that into RDX, then we use an indirection into the first field of the object, that's a zero offset, to find the V table, and then we load that into the register. We then do a further index into the V table at the zero offset, and that is going to give us the actual address of the method. So we now have the address of the method in RDX. Before we invoke the method, we also have to put this as the first parameter so that the method knows that it's being invoked on this object. Now we've got all this set up. We have this in RDI, that's the first parameter, and we have the address of the method in RDX, and so we can just do an indirect call to invoke the method. We can do the same thing here for F2, and note that in that case, we're going to offset it to the V table. So first we get the object address, that's the address of D, then we offset that by eight to find the second slot in the V table, then we actually access that slot to get the address of F2. And then after we set up this, we can call F2 with an indirect call. The same thing, of course, happens for F3, although in this case the offset is 16. Just as before, when I copy a duck pointer into a bird pointer variable, we just copy the value. There's no changes that happen here. In this case, b is at 32 off the base pointer. And when we access the methods, it's exactly the same as before. So here, when I access f1, that's just directly accessing the zeroth element of the v table. And when I'm accessing f2, that's the eighth element of the v table.
C++ also supports multiple inheritance of fields and methods. I'm going to show you fields which are somewhat simpler to read in the assembly code, but the idea for methods is just the same. So here I have a bird class. Uh, note that not all birds fly, so I'm going to have a flying class. And so these are bird properties like pecking and flying properties like flapping or something. In any case, a duck now is both a bird and a flying thing, and it has some of its own properties as well. And so when I create a duck now, I've got six properties I can fill in, and then I can mess around with the duck both as a bird or as a flying thing. And you'll see that when I actually print these things out, I do get what I expect. Um, the bird and the flying thing have the appropriate values that I've assigned into them. Um, but in addition, it's interesting to see what the pointers here are. You would expect that the pointer D and the pointer B are the same, and indeed they are. So here's the pointer D that I print out and the pointer B that I print out. But you would also expect that the pointer D is equal to the pointer of F. After all, I did an assignment here. But note that this is actually not the case. D is at address 20, if you look just the low order bits, whereas F is at address 28. Why this shifting? Well, let's look at the assembly code to find out. When a duck was just extending one superclass, it was really easy to lay out the fields because I could just put the superclass fields first and then the subclass fields later. That's not so easy if I'm extending two classes because I can't put both of them first. I've got to pick one. And C++ picks the order that you specify. So here I've said, first I'm a bird, then I'm a flying thing. And so the layout is going to put the bird fields first and the flying thing fields second. And then finally, after those, we'll get the duck fields last. Again, note they're all integers, they're all four bytes. So my duck now takes 24 bytes to store. And if you load all these variables up, it does exactly what you would expect. I'm going to get the duck pointer into some register, and then I'm going to access the fields relative to that register. So note the first field I'm assigning here is D1, and that is 16 off the base pointer, um, and so on and so forth. You might note in particular that B2 here is getting assigned 8432, and that is four off of the base pointer, which is where you expect it to be. So you can see the assignment from uh, the D pointer to B pointer is just copying as before, and the access is just as you would expect. So here I'm accessing B1 and B2, so that's zero off and four off of the object pointer. Instead, when we take the duck pointer and copy it into a flying thing pointer, we're doing an implicit coercion when someone gives you a flying thing, you're going to expect that the F1 field is at index 0, not index 8. And therefore, I, I can't use a duck pointer directly like a flying thing pointer the way I can use it like a bird pointer. Now, I actually need to shift it. So we're going to move the pointer by 8 bytes here so that when F looks at its flying thing, it will find F1 in the appropriate place, which is at a 0 offset, not a 8 offset. This explains the code here, which actually does a shift or an add off of the value of the original pointer that I've got in memory. I've lighted some extra code, which is included here, to make sure that if D is 0, then F will also be 0. That's for null handling. But once I've got my shiny F reference, I can actually treat F like a flying thing. And therefore, when I look at the field F1, I actually don't do any offset. It's right at offset 0. And when I look at field 2, I look at 4 off, not 12 off. This same kind of shifting views is necessary anytime we have multiple inheritance. And this is the reason that multiple inheritance of interfaces in Java requires us to have multiple V tables for each object. We're going to have one V table for each interface that the object realizes. And whenever Java does a call through an interface variable, it actually passes the appropriate V table as a separate parameter.
This is why interface calls are slightly more expensive than method calls on a class in Java. C++ is unusual for allowing multiple inheritance of fields. Most languages disallow this because it does complicate basic field access in the language. On the other hand, all class-based languages do allow multiple inheritance of methods through interfaces or some sort of similar mechanism. So that's a very fast introduction to the implementation of object-oriented programming in C++. If you understand a little bit of assembly language, you can look at the output of the C++ compiler and study it to see how the features of the language are implemented. That's di more difficult in languages like Java, where it outputs a class file, and God knows, it's executing on the Java virtual machine, which is already a very complicated beast. C++ has a much simpler execution model. We just translate the source code directly to machine code and run it. There's no intermediate virtual machine that we need to understand.